Okay, good afternoon. Allow me, first of all, to congratulate the team that was able to convert this year is to real political forum to an online event that I'm sure will be a success. Despite the early sometimes you are going through, we have to resist and make things happen if we want to overcome the challenges this pandemic is imposing on all of us. A special word of welcome to my partners in this panel and to Professor Sean Carlos Spada and Rita Seabra de Brito, thanking them for the invitation to be here again uh, this afternoon. As in previous years, we'll have the privilege this afternoon to listen to some exceptional speakers, as José Manuel Durão Barroso, on topics they have special insights. European Union, the Atlantic Alliance, and the values of liberal democracy are in general recognized as pillars of the long period of peace we have lived since the Second World War. But I think it's appropriate to quote from Pope Francis' last and remarkable encyclical letter, Fratelli Tutti. War is not a ghost from the past, and it's becoming a constant threat. The world is facing more difficulties. In the slow path to peace, it had undertaken and was going, giving some fruits. Let me introduce to you the chair of this panel, uh, uh, Dr. Arthur Meyer. I think that is a, the second or some time that I'm introducing you, but I have here your <laughs> biography. Dr. Meyer is the acting director of the European and official fellow and tutor in politics and international relations at St. Peter's College, Oxford. He holds positions as adjunct professor in European and Eurasian Studies at John Hopkins University, School of Advanced International Studies, Bologna, and director of the European Studies Center in, at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Hartman also teaches for the Blavtonic, sorry, Blavatnik School of Government, Oxford, Hong Kong's Fellows Program, and is region head Europe and uh, at Oxford Analytica, a global consultancy. He studied history, politics, and drama at the Free University of Berlin before undertaking graduate studies in international relations at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, at Harvard University at, and the University of Cambridge. He received his doctorate in international relations from St. Anthony's College, University, University of Oxford. Prior to his academic career, Helmut worked for more than 10 years as a freelance journalist in Germany. Helmut, now you have the floor, I think, to introduce José Manuel de Roberts. Thank you, Ambassador Thank you. Montero, and I'm extremely delighted to be back at the Estoril Forum, which I have enjoyed for many, many years. And I would also like to thank the organizers, um, Professor Espada and his entire team, um, Rita Zaebra Brito, everyone who put so much effort into this. And I'm delighted to chair the first session on a theme that is more important than ever. We have, um, as the president in his opening remarks have said, reminded ourselves how important liberal democracy is and this is a joint project of the Transatlantic Alliance. And I think that's the theme of this particular um, session. And um, I'm delighted to introduce Jose Manuel Barroso. And I've said before, you don't have to introduce Jose Manuel Barroso. He is the most famous European person across the globe, being known in Portugal, in Europe, in America, and everywhere. But let me share some um, little pointers. He is currently working for Goldman Sachs, but of course we all know him best as the former president of the European Commission, as Prime Minister of Portugal, Minister of Foreign Affairs, but he's also a scholar. So he teaches not only in Lisbon, he teaches in Geneva, he teaches in Florence at the new transnational governance school. So who better than opening our program than Jose Manuel Barroso as far as the marching orders are concerned. I think I give um, President Barroso the floor and will later introduce the discussions. So um, Jose Manuel Barroso, we are looking forward to your opening remarks 
about 20 minutes on the theme of this panel. President Barroso. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antmut Meyer. Thank you for your extremely kind words. And thank you also to, to our hosts, namely my good friend Antonio Monteiro and also Rita Siavra de Brito. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, with you, albeit by virtual form, and also my colleagues of panel, William Hofmeister and Karl Gershman. And let me also use the occasion to uh, send a word of thanks and congratulations to Professor João Carlos Spada, director of our Instituto de Estudos Políticos, and also to all the staff and faculty that have uh, worked so hard for this uh, forum this year uh, to become a reality. It's uh, indeed a pleasure for me and an honor to be uh, once again participating in this such important political forum with so many students following us um, by video. So the topic, the European Union Atlantic Alliance and liberal democracy is indeed a very difficult one because it is one of those topics where we need to understand the complexities of politics, it's extremely political by definition, but also especially international politics, including matters that have to do with the core of sovereignty, but also on issues, not only about political regimes, but about security and defense. And also it's a matter where uh, it's difficult sometimes to find a balance from a political point of view between interests and values. Because let's be frank, in the world uh, of politics, it's impossible to avoid uh, the question of interests, even when we are very committed to uh, some basic fundamental interests and values. I will not engage in a uh, exercise of definition about what is liberal democracy and not liberal democracy. For me, I, by the way, as the President of the Republic just said, uh, I would say, naturally, democracy is liberal because democracy is based on the concept of freedom and not individual freedom and also open societies. But I mean, for me, I can live perfectly well with the definition of the values that are is presented in Article 2 of the Lisbon Treaty of the Treaty of the European Union, when it states clearly that the European Union is founded on the values of respect of human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, and also the uh, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. And it goes on the same article stating its commitment to pluralism, the principle of non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, and also equality and non uh, and uh, equality between men and women. So, I mean, quite ambitious as you see. So it's a requisite to be a member of the European Union, and it was so also to become a member of the European community to adhere to support these values. And by the way, that was the reason why some countries that were uh, not democratic before could not join the European community, namely my own country, Portugal, that before 74 was living under authoritarian regime. And in fact, there were some discussion about Portugal joining the European community. And there were certainly in the Portuguese political elite at that time, people in favor of that, because Portugal, differently from Spain, was a member of EFTA, European Free Trade Association. But Portugal, like by the way, Greece, that was also a member of, uh, of NATO, could not join the European community and also Spain because it was not a democracy. And the same, of course, goes, goes without saying all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, including the Baltics, that were under Soviet totalitarian regimes. In fact, some of those countries were not even independent, like the three Baltic countries that were, in fact, uh, part of the Soviet Union. So this is a very important point. The European Union has a requisite to be a union of democracies. This is not the case, by the way, for NATO. While NATO, in fact, was and remains committed to the overall values of democracy and freedom, and it's stated in its preamble, and it's in the North Atlantic Treaty, the reality is that Portugal, with an authoritarian, by the way, colonial regime, 
Portugal was a founding member of NATO. And so was Greece or Turkey and other countries that we cannot say that were democracies. So there is, uh, European Union is one of the very few organizations, international organizations that has as a prerequisite the uh, commitment to democratic values. This is one of the reasons why today it is so difficult for the European Union, the debate about the quality of democracy and the rule of law that is taking place, in fact, with some uh, very uh, difficult issues concerning some of our member states, including with procedures launched uh, on the basis of Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty um, um, to some of our, the governments of the European Union. And this is, of course, an existential issue for the European Union because, in fact, it can reduce its legitimacy if these matters are not properly solved. We can come to that later if you want. Now, the, the topic is the European Union, the Atlantic Alliance, and liberal democracy. I believe it's what we can do together. Now, about NATO, NATO is certainly the most successful military alliance in history. And uh, NATO was able not only to contain um, the Soviet Union, in fact, it was instrumental for the collapse of the Soviet Union, but also it was able to adapt and change after the collapse of the Soviet Union while keeping its core mission. And its core mission is the defense of its members. Nowadays, uh, in fact, we can say that NATO is performing its job. That at least is my assessment. There was the summit in London, December 2019. There was a mandate for further reform. It's called a program called NATO 2030. And NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, former Prime Minister of Norway, good friend of mine, by the way, he will present recommendations next year to keep um, the strengthening of NATO uh, as a strong military alliance, as a strong political alliance, and with a global approach. Because if it is true that NATO is a regional alliance, uh, and security guarantees only apply to Europe and North America countries, it is true, but NATO has a global reach because it needs to have a global reach well beyond the Europe and North Atlantic because there are some global threats like terrorism, cybersecurity, I mean, the arms race. And NATO is increasingly focused now on issues like resilience, protection of infrastructure, and some uh, ways of dealing with some new types of challenges and threats. And of course, there is a discussion going on about how NATO is going to face China, because the rise of China is certainly the most important development in international relations of the last decades. And what can be the impact of China in terms of the future of the Atlantic Alliance? But today, I think we can say that there is a consensus among its allies that NATO needs to have a global approach. Now, Let's, let's now face difficult issues. Uh, there is today, and I will, I'm measuring my words, but I think uh, I'm giving a fair assessment. We are probably facing the worst moment uh, in terms of trust between the United States and European allies since the creation of NATO. Um, it's not the first time there are problems inside NATO, problems of trust, of political trust, not only the Suez crisis in the 50s, sort in 56, but also France's decision to leave the military uh, structure in the 60s, uh, the issues concerning Cyprus in 74 and following years, also the Asian, the Asia, uh, and the sea in the 90s, of course, divisions uh, about Iraq uh, in 2003 and the following years, and also the, always some kind of conflict between Turkey and, and Greece, but the recent developments concerning Turkey also that are uh, worrying, not only in terms of internal developments in the country, but also the international standing and its activism from Syria and Libya to um, Nagorno-Karabakh, which of course is raising issues of uh, uh, concern among its allies, not to speak about other uh, decisions like the decision of uh, uh, Turkey to buy military equipment to, to, the, to the Russia and, of course, putting in question some of the traditional relationship between Turkey and NATO and specifically Turkey and the United States of America. So 
but there is a doubt now. Um, there are some doubts uh, regarding the commitment of all the allies to NATO. I think the reality is that NATO operationally is not in crisis. NATO is in fact working probably better than before. I believe that the redeployment of forces in NATO makes sense, namely strengthening the presence in the Baltics and in the Black Sea or near the Black Sea. But the reality is that confidence and trust is indivisible. And there is today a very bad moment in level of confidence between most European governments, probably two or three are different, uh, but the confidence of the governments of, Euro of, Europe, of Europe and uh, the current American administration. Let's be honest about it. Uh, in fact, even before the election of the current American president, there were doubts expressed by him as a candidate and by people close to him about the applicability of Article 5th of the North Atlantic Treaty. So an Article 5th, of course, is the core of NATO. It's about collective defense. Uh, is the one that states that an armed attack against one or more of the allies in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. And each of them will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force. So this is, I mean, this is the core. Um, and there were doubts, uh, I remember among others, expressed for instance by a brilliant American politician, very close to uh, then candidate uh, to President Trump, uh, Newt Gingrich, where he says, he says, why should, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure I would risk a nuclear war on some place which is in the suburbs of St. Petersburg. Uh, that he was mentioning, it was answering a question about, about Estonia. That reminds me, comments made by the French left um, um, in the 30s, uh, when there was expansion of Hitler and when uh, the French uh, socialists, they said, why die for Danzig? And in fact, that was an encouragement to uh, the uh, uh, further policy, the, for, the tragic policy of Hitler and National Socialism. So uh, afterwards, this was corrected. And as I said today, thanks to the leadership and wise uh, in many circles in the United States and Europe, uh, wise leaders, including uh, military people, were able to keep NATO running and fit for purpose. But in fact, there is an issue of confidence and that issue of confidence has to do with other matters, including, for instance, the, the antipathy, to say the, last, the, the least, that the current American president has for the European Union. Let's not forget a very important thing. The European community was, when it was created, also an inspiration of the United States of America. I mean, the Americans were at the origin of European integration. Marshall Plan was an American, a great show of leadership and strategic intelligence, Marshall Plan. But the founding fathers, as we usually say, of the European community, they were all pro-Americans from uh, Jean Monnet that was in fact during the war in the United States, working for the United States, a Frenchman, but also Konrad Adenauer in Germany or Alice de Gasperi in, in Italy. They were, most of them were center-right politicians very close to the United States and to the defense of what we were then calling the free world against namely Soviet expansionism. But today I cannot say that uh, the current president is in fact supporting the European Union. In fact, uh, when we, we were surprised to see uh, the current American presence uh, establishing, uh, let's say tariffs to, uh, in terms of aluminum and steel on the basis of national security arguments, not only by the way to Europe, European Union, but also to Canada and Mexico. Um, okay, I understand there are differences and there, are, there is competition in terms of trade. But to use a national security argument um, against allies, it seems to me a little difficult. Not to speak about, of course, very well-known differences that are strategic, like uh, uh, in terms of trade with the, 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 I mean, the collapse of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the talks, but also on uh, issues that are strategic, like the Iran agreement, where the United States left the agreement that was in fact 
uh, made to a large extent by the United States themselves, uh, and also um, climate change issue, where the United States administration left the treaty. In fact, this, the only country that left the, the convention uh, or the treaty that was signed in, uh, in, in Paris. And this is creating, in fact, a problem of um, confidence. Now, I'm saying that very bluntly. Why? Because I believe, and for, by the way, declaration of interest, I'm very much a transatlantic person. In fact, during my political life, I, I, I took some important risks uh, in, because of supporting uh, American position in Europe in many areas, because I believe it was in the, our interest as Europeans in some areas to, to, to go close to the United States and the United States close to us. So that is my declaration of interest. So I'm a committed European, but a, a transatlantic person in favor of strong uh, transatlantic bonds. But we see that today there is a lack of complicity. Complicity between the leaders of Europe and the United States. To be very fair, this did not start with President Trump. Uh, I remember several talks and co conversations I had, including summits with President Obama. And for me, it was clear that the priority in the mind of President Obama was not, not Europe, but Asia. Uh, he said, it's public, but also in some of our discussions, he said that, uh, that he established so-called pivot to Asia, because it's true that Asia now is growing more than Europe. And so it can be from an economic point of view, probably more attractive for a politician in the United States. And of course, the United States being not only an Atlantic power, but a Pacific power. So the United States have, a, a, of course, a, a, a very unique and by the way, comfortable, I would say, um, uh, geopolitical position that gives them that advantage of being uh, at the same time um, an Atlantic power and a Pacific power. And by the way, a global power. And today, still, I think the most important power globally. Now, this raises a very important issue is can we restore this level of complicity between the United States and Europe? I believe we can. Probably are not going to come to the statu quo ante. I think some damage has been already made, to be frank with you. Uh, some issues regarding NATO, I think they are being dealt with. There is a point where I think President Trump uh, is right when he makes the issue that Europeans have not been uh, investing sufficiently in their own defense. By the way, it was not only Trump. I remember being present in many NATO meetings since I was deputy for a minister, for a minister in the 80s and the 90s. President Clinton, President George W. Bush, President Obama, they said the same, but of course, President Trump says it in his very idiosyncratic style. So having said that, I think he's basically right that Europeans should commit more to their common defense. Having said that now, uh, we need to create this level of convergence so that we can promote the values of democracy globally. Can we do it without breaking, let's say, decoupling the global order and creating a new Cold War? I believe we can. I think we have to have a sophisticated strategy. We have to make a distinction between areas where we oppose, we have some of our adversaries, but areas where globally we cooperate. I think no one uh, reasonable, no reasonable person will disagree that uh, we need uh, in this very fragmented and polarized world to uh, keep some level of cooperation between uh, Europe, United States, uh, China, Russia, and others on issues that are common public goods, the fight to protect our planet from climate change, to, um, to, um, to protect this world from pandemics that is now a current, a current threat that we are living through. Um, or to international, um, against international terrorism, or for financial stability, or open trade. These are matters that require cooperation beyond political regimes and ideologies. But at the same time, yes, I see, I have four more minutes, I will conclude. Uh, at the, thank you, uh, Hartmut. At the same time, I think we should keep a complicity between democracies. Not necessarily, and that was probably one of the issues uh, where we would not successful. Not necessarily uh, uh, being promoting from an active point of view regime change. 
because I think now we have understood the limits of foreign intervention for a regime change, but promoting those values. And there are many ways to do it internally by going to the European Union as well. That is something that uh, we, we have to do, but also externally supporting human rights, raising our voice when there is a clear violation of human rights, as we are seeing now from uh, China to, to, to Belarus or, uh, or many other situations in the world. And there we need a strong determination of the leaders of the Europe. And, uh, and Europe, I of course say Europe and not only the European Union because countries like UK, that by the way now leaving the European Union, it's uh, an additional issue, an additional problem from this point of view. But a country like Norway, uh, Turkey I already mentioned it's more complex and complicated as well, but countries that are not NATO from uh, Switzerland to many others, that they are part of the community of democracies. So we need this community of democracies to continue and to push a global agenda. But from my point of view, that should be a global agenda for democracy. And of course, I mean, I mean liberal democracy, open societies, but also multilateralism. Because I think one of the problems we have, uh, some time ago in a conference of the Club de Madrid, I made this point and someone spoke about this as an indispensable a trinity, okay, <laughs> they call it my indispensable trinity, and it is a, a trinity. So we have to think about open societies, but rule of law and democracy, but also multilateralism. We, uh, it's difficult to be open internally and not to be open outside. I also don't think it's credible, those who say they are committed to multilateral order, but they are not committed to uh, open, uh, they, have, uh, they preach openness globally, but they do not practice openness with their own citizens. And there is a authoritarian or totalitarian regime inside. So there is a very important link, sometimes difficult to identify, between the openness at national and global level. And this is where I think Europe has a role to play. And certainly I need to do, I, I think for this to be successful, we need to work hand in hand with our transatlantic partners, namely the United States of America, but certainly also Canada and others, our, mem our, our allies in NATO. So this is uh, my introduction to our very important topic of today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, President Barroso, for this inspiring opening remark. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you reminded us of the essentials, but it's important to keep reminding us over and over again, how much the transatlantic alliance was the origin of the European Union. How much democracy is the prerequisite of the European Union? How important open societies are, and if I may say so, the year 2020 reminds us that this is not a given. We have to fight for openness democracy over and over again, both in America and in Europe, because what the pandemic has shown is that what is the right balance between individual freedom and the state protecting health? What is the right balance between health and the economy? And these are very, very important questions. What is the rule of law? Who has the right to defend it? And I think it's very, very important to remind ourselves. We have two excellent discussions um, to Josie Manuel Rosa's opening remarks. And I have to say, both of them have committed their professional life to the defense and promotion of democracy. Carl Gershman is the president of the National Endowment of Democracy. He has been a distinguished diplomat, a distinguished civil servant. He is naturally a scholar, and he is um, a long, long, long time member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a committed transatlanticist. Willem Hofmeister works for the Adenauer Foundation, and I cannot think of an institution that has done so much to promote democracy all over the world as some of the German foundations. And that includes not only the Adenauer foundations, but all party foundations. The work they've done in Latin America and so on when democracy was under threat is a significant contribution. Willem Hofmeister is the director of the Adenauer Foundation for Spain and Portugal. He is a distinguished scholar. He worked at the University of Mainz and um, he has been with the Adenauer Foundation in Brazil, in Chile, has worked on Asian affairs, African affairs, um, he is very much committed to the agenda. So I would like to think Carl could enlighten us a little bit about the situation in America, 
roughly two weeks before what most people consider to be one of the most important elections that we have seen in the history of America. Carl. Thank you very much, uh, Hartmut. Uh, and I want to begin both by thanking you, by thanking my dear friend, Joao Carlos Shishpada, for organizing this conference during the time of COVID, and also to uh, Jose Manuel Barroso for what I think was a really wonderful, uh, comprehensive uh, overview to introduce this panel and to introduce this conference. I want to begin um, by saying that in my view, democracy is being challenged today as never before since the end of the Cold War, and really uh, since the period that Sam Huntington, Professor Huntington, called uh, the second reverse wave, which preceded the beginning of the third wave that started in Portugal in 1974. I think democracy is being challenged today more severely than at any moment since that time. Of course, you had the enormous expansion of democracy during the period of the third wave that began in Portugal. But today we are seeing a dramatic reversal of this pro progress. It started in 2006. Um, and since then, political and civil uh, freedoms globally have declined for 14 consecutive years, according to the annual Freedom House survey. And um, according to our friend Larry Diamond, who was present in Estoril at the last conference and just published a new uh, study, uh, the regression of democracy is especially pronounced among the world's largest, most geopolitically significant um, states. Um, he notes a lot of these states are members of the G20, and he notes that of the 29 most populous and geopolitically weighty countries, nine, 19 of these 29 countries have experienced very substantive declines in freedom between 2005 and 2019, while only two countries uh, have improved and the, the improvement has been relatively modest. Uh, and many of these states, while they remain democratic, have, have seen a deterioration uh, in their democracy, including the four largest democracies in the world, which are the United States, India, Indonesia, and Brazil, and Poland, which is the largest uh, democracy in Central Europe. Um, Larry Diamond also points out uh, another disturbing uh, statistic, statistic, which is that of the 20 countries that have experienced mass public protests, so-called color revolutions, um, since the Green Revolution in Iran in 2009, only two of these uprisings, which a lot of people put a great deal of hope in, only two of them uh, have actually resulted in democratic transitions, two of 20 countries. And even these transitions in Tunisia and in Ukraine have been very, very fragile and uncertain. We know a lot of the reasons for this reversal, the resurgence of authoritarianism um, led by the principal authoritarian countries in the world, Russia and China, the backsliding um, in countries where elected leaders have hollowed out uh, democratic institutions such as free media, the rule of law, uh, free elections, uh, undermining civil society, uh, leading to very high levels of corruption, um, and also we've seen a uh, very disturbing rise of populism uh, in the established Western countries. There are many reasons for that, one of which is the, the rise of uh, social media, uh, which has um, really contributed to the division of uh, open and democratic societies um, the, uh, that's provided uh, opportunities for authoritarian countries to both increase their own surveillance and control and also their inter interference uh, in democratic countries. We've seen a shift away from manufacturing, um, increasing um, the uh, shift to finance and technological knowledge production, which has increased the economic insecurity of large share parts of the population in democratic countries, the acceleration of globalization, which has further marginalized uh, many people who formerly uh, held manufacturing jobs, people of less education, people in more rural areas. And finally, uh, of course, the uh, 
the 2008 financial uh, crash, which originated in the US, further, further badly damaged uh, the reputation uh, and the prestige of democracy. And the, this convergence of factors has resulted in rising uh, polarization, um, inequality, and economic distress in uh, democratic, uh, democratic countries. And then on top of this, we now have uh, the pandemic, um, which uh, according to a recent Freedom House uh, survey uh, has fueled uh, what it calls a crisis of democracy, uh, noting that the conditions for human rights and democracy uh, have grown worse in 80 countries since the uh, start of the uh, pandemic with governments uh, using uh, the pandemic as an excuse to silence critics, uh, to weaken institutions and to under undermine systems of accountability. Uh, you mentioned, um, uh, Professor Mayer, that uh, democracy need is the only system that can really establish the kind of balance you're talking about. And in June, uh, we, along with International Idea and 71 or, uh, other organizations, and Joao's uh, Institute was a part of this, launched a call to defend democracy, which talked about why democracy is so important in this context. And it was signed by 62 former heads of state, 13 Nobel laureates. Uh, it was a very important statement, but there's a very uh, critical uh, struggle that is now underway. And the democratic recession that began as a slow and quite uneven ebbing, according to Larry, uh, of uh, progress uh, over these past dec decade and a half is now, in his words, has morphed into a substantial and comprehensive regression of freedom and democracy uh, in the world. Um, and uh, this is unusual for Larry, who coined the term, we're in a democratic recession to describe the period of the last decade and a half, who's now said that we have probably already entered what Samuel Huntington would have called a reverse third wave. It's the first time uh, Larry has ever said that, uh, a period in the history when the number of transitions away from democracy uh, significantly outnumbered the number of transitions to democracy. Now look, I think there's some reason for hope and I wanna to get to that. Uh, I'm encouraged that the European Union has taken important steps to become more unified I think the next generation EU initiative, which is a almost a 700 uh, million euro plan for investment and reform in the aftermath of COVID uh, through the creation of this recovery and resilience facility uh, that will help poorer countries become more sustainable is very important in strengthening the European Union at this time. I also think that the Putin regime in Russia is showing increased signs of weakness and vulnerability. Uh, the sustained popular uprising in Belarus in reaction to the stolen election on August the 9th is an epical event. Uh, Belarus is a nation reborn uh, today. And while Lukashenko and with Russian support may try to suppress this popular movement, he has lost legitimacy and will not be able to succeed in my view. And I don't believe that Russia can intervene militarily to save him. The, the very same kind of movement of young people, women, uh, technologically savvy activists, small entrepreneurs and workers uh, is also appeared in Khabarovsk and other cities in the Russian Far East and elsewhere across Russia. The economists noted, I think correctly, that the main reason, I mean, what we're talking about, this crisis for Russia is the main reason they resorted to the desperate move of poisoning the country's main opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. And there is, there, are, there is now the, another uprising in Kyrgyzstan where the same types of forces of women and young people, tech savvy uh, activists uh, and others uh, has ousted uh, the, uh, the, pres the, uh, the president and they will, have a new, uh, they will have a new election and Putin has not been able to uh, protect these leaders uh, who, whose power is based on organized crime. And not least, uh, uh, President Barroso mentioned Nagorno-Karabakh and there Putin appears hap hapless in trying to mediate an end to, the Nagor to this uh, terrible conflict in Erdogan uh, or, or counter Erdogan's aggressive support for Aliyev. Thank you, I'm almost finished. Uh, aggressive support for Aliyev in Azerbaijan uh, and his use uh, remarkably of Syrian mercenaries uh, in Azerbaijan. Now we get to the issue of the United States and there, 
And I think the United States, in my view, might be on the verge of changing course. Um, I run a uh, bipartisan organization uh, and won't comment on, I can't really comment on the election, uh, but I wanna, uh, we can all see where events are trending and I wanna put in a little plug for the session we're gonna have tomorrow uh, under the George Washington Memorial debate where we're gonna have two leading specialists in the US, Bill Crystal and Bill Goldston, one a Republican, one a Democrat, uh, talking uh, about America at a crossroads, what path forward. And the path ahead will be difficult because the United States today is a very divided country. Uh, there are very disturbing polls showing that about a third of Americans believe uh, would, would justify violence uh, if the election didn't go their way. And there's an article that appeared just uh, last week in Foreign Policy uh, that uh, where people thought 31% of Americans thought it would be a good idea to have a strong incumbent leader who does not have to bother with Congress and elections. So this is very, very dangerous. And we have a lot of work to do to heal our divided country and to revive the commitment to what uh, John McCain, uh, his belief that the US is a country uh, with a conscience um, and uh, a commitment to uh, the, the transatlantic alliance. I think it's possible and we'll discuss that tomorrow. But even if the US does return to a path of democracy, we face this enormous challenge of China. Lu Xiaobo uh, in an essay in 2006 said what a threat a rising dictatorial China would pose to the rest of the world. And here we have China's aggression in uh, its crackdown in Hong, Kong, in Hong Kong, its aggression in the South China Sea, uh, it, the military clashes along the border with India, the threats to invade Taiwan, the attempt to destroy minority Uyghur and Tibetan peoples, which under international law is considered to be genocide and the strengthening of the surveillance state internally and Chinese, two minutes, okay. And Chinese um, uh, extension of its influence globally through the Belt and Road Initiative and not least uh, its effort within the UN uh, to change uh, the, uh, to re really rewrite the international norms uh, that govern the world today. In conclusion, let me say that we are now engaged in what the EU's foreign minister, Josef Varel, has called a battle of narratives between countries like China and Russia, espousing authoritarian values and systems and democratic countries that need to defend democratic values. The great investment that Russia and China, among others, are making in media and forms of technological infrastructure, such as the Kremlin's uh, info uh, uh, interference policies and uh, united front operations by China. Uh, this is trying to undermine the norms of democratic societies and the international liberal order that, the, that, uh, that show that the conflict over values today uh, uh, and the defense of freedom is now, uh, and the rule of law is now, has now become a new arena of strategic competition. In this new period, we need a strong alliance of democracies and a reinvigorated transatlantic relationship. This has become at least as important as it was during the Cold War. What's needed more than anything is renewed political will and a readiness to work together among the world's leading democracies. Without that, the global threat to freedom cannot be reversed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Willem. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Meyer. First of all, of course, I would like to uh, send my greetings uh, and my thanks to Professor Espada, Professor Rita Brito, and all uh, those who have worked very hard to make this uh, historical political forum happen. Uh, although we all would have liked to meet, of course, uh, in person in Espril. Uh, thank you also for my co-panelists uh, for this inspiring uh, first uh, start, uh, the presentation of Jose Manuel Barroso and the comment of uh, Karl Gershman. And I think I can uh, connect directly with what Karl Gershman has said, uh, that uh, we have uh, to work together. I have uh, just a few points. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention and remember that uh, in a panel called the EU, the Atlantic Alliance and Liberal Democracy, Liberal Democracy from the very beginning was a link between uh, Europe and North America. It is a link of the Atlantic Alliance. Without our commitment to liberal democracy, the Atlantic Alliance never would have been 
organized after the Second World War, and it was only uh, 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 states uh, with this democratic uh, commitment who built up the Atlantic Alliance, which is much more than NATO. Of course, uh, within NATO there are, there have been, and there are still, unfortunately, some countries with uh, serious problems regarding democracy, but the, the, the guiding spirit, at least from a German point of view, uh, to uh, join the Atlantic Alliance uh, was the commitment with democracy and the link with the biggest and the most powerful and the most advanced democracy in that time, which was the United States. And the Atlantic Alliance and democracy not only was uh, important for the internal development of democracy, but it was the example, it was the, the model uh, for the world, for the entire world. And this is, I think, that's my second point. This is, I think, this is a serious problem, actually, that we have lost a little bit our character as uh, the model for democracy. I do not say that all democracy on earth have to be organized and modeled uh, uh, in the same way like the United States or the European democracies. But the principal uh, ideas of liberal democracy, personal freedom, state of law, rule of law, and so on, uh, these are the principles which had been an example for all over the world and over the last 40 years, 50 years, when we experienced several uh, waves of democracy. So uh, we have served as a kind of a rule model. Of course, we have also supported uh, with money and uh, with all our knowledge and all our errors as well. Uh, we have tried to support uh, development of democracy outside. And I think this is a serious challenge actually for democracy because our democracies um, are also affected by this virus um, of um, anti-democratic or at least problematic developments. I just want to uh, uh, underline uh, the issue of populism and the issue of nationalism. These are two very serious topics uh, we face in Europe, actually. I do not want to speak about the United States or the Northern America or other parts of the world at this moment. But I would say we in Europe are facing, and unfortunately within the European Union, we know about that, uh, we are facing serious problems regarding our basic principles of our democracies. And so uh, although the European Union is investing a lot of money in promotion of democracy, but the credibility of our international activities depends highly on our own capacity to, to, to build up and to, to, to strengthen our own democracies. And unfortunately, we have uh, to admit that at the moment, uh, we have serious challenges in several countries and we have to face this. We have to face populism and we have to face nationalism. There is a lot of discussion about that. I don't want have to, I don't have to, to refer to all aspects of that, but I have to mention that this is harming our efforts to promote democracy also abroad. And another point, uh, of course, uh, Karl has mentioned it as well, another point is that democracy is openly under attack as never before. We have uh, two uh, states, uh, China and Russia, who by means of technological interference and other aspects try uh, to counter attack, let me say, or to, to stop our efforts or counter um, to, to, to stop uh, uh, democratic developments, not only in the immediate uh, sphere of uh, influence, like in the case of Russia, actually in Belarus, uh, or in the case of China in Hong Kong and others, but also internationally. We know about uh, the efforts of Russia and China to interfere in elections abroad. And this is a serious challenge, of course, also for democracy. Why do they do this? because they, are, they fear that their own political systems cannot uh, compete uh, with uh, liberal democracy. So uh, beside all economic development, beside all social achievements, uh, they know that people at the end of the day want personal freedom, they want to speak out, they want to organize themselves and so on. And so of course they want also have, they all want to have 
these nice things which are elements of uh, liberal democracy and these states and their, uh, their, their governors and their governments do not want uh, to hand over uh, these kind of aspects uh, to their people and therefore they are attacking democracy. So what we can do? Um, I think we have to work very hard uh, in our own context to strengthen our democracies, to stop populist parties uh, to succeed, uh, even in countries with all respect, even in countries with, like Portugal, who has never had uh, populist experiences over the last decades. We can now see that the small party is growing up. And in Germany, we have a serious situation. And in other countries of the European Union, we have these problems. So we have to work on our own democracy to be able to convincingly promote democracy abroad. Uh, Karl has mentioned uh, the developments, uh, the problems of democracy uh, in several countries, uh, the regression of democracy. We are talking about that since a couple of years. And so uh, I think it is necessary to strengthen or to increase our efforts to promote democracy. And so I'm very happy that uh, at the Estoril Political Forum, we always have the possibility to exchange that there are a lot of people here uh, listening to us, participating in the debate, who are committed to this effort. And so I, I would like uh, to thank the organizers and I very much hope to get some new ideas also for our work in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Willem Hofmeister, for reminding us how important it is to think about our own democracy while at the same time prom promoting democracy abroad. My understanding is Professor Rita Zaibra Brito will organize and mediate the question and answer session. Rita, have there been questions for the panel? If so, yes. please direct yes. them, Rita. Yes. Thank you, Professor Meyer. I would like to start uh, by thanking our distinguished guest speakers for their inspiring contributions. Thank you so much. Uh, and we now have much food for thought, so we can move to the Q&A moment. We received some questions. I, I will read uh, three of them. And then I will um, come back to the panel for comment. Uh, the first question is by a professor of the Institute, André Esvedoalvus, uh, and he asks how to address the risks of the EU applying double standards in evaluating democratic standards. Uh, sorry, uh, how to address the risks of the EU applying double standards in evaluating democratic standards depending on the parties in government in different member states? This is one question. Uh, we have another question uh, by um, uh, Afonso Lopes de Freitas Dantas. Given the recent speech by President uh, Xi Jinping to his troops, what should NATO do if China invades Taiwan? Another question. And a third question to the panel. Um, given the danger, uh, it is a question by a student of Universidad Nova de Lisboa, another university. Uh, given the danger posed by l'Islam du XXe siècle and militant Islam, can Dominic Raab be the bridge between the USA and the EU? And so I, I will come back to the panel for comments, please. I don't know if uh, Mr. Jose Manuel Barroso would like to start. The floor okay. is yours. <laughs> uh, I can, thank you very much, Rita. So uh, first question uh, of Professor André Zvidwalsh. Um, these risks of double standards um, exist. I agree with, I think, his, his underlying concern. In fact, uh, today, uh, to be very blunt, uh, there is a trend in some circles in the European Union to consider um, populism authoritarian when it comes to from the right and not from the left. In fact, the first government we had in Europe since the beginning uh, of the European community that was basically against European consensus and populism was the Greek government of Syriza. It was not certainly not a a center-right or a right-wing party. Or, by the way, they were in a coalition on extreme right 
party, right-wing party, nationalist party in the coalition. But ideologically came from the left, okay? But it's true that today in Europe, when we speak about populism, probably not only in Europe, we think about right-wing policies. For me, the important point is not being right-wing or left-wing, it's about being democratic or non-democratic. And uh, in European terms, to be committed or not to the European Union project for those who are members of the European Union. So that's why, um, when I was in the European Commission, I was speaking always about the need to address these concerns of um, uh, rule of law by applying very strictly the rules, the treaty rules. We have a treaty, and and there is there are courts. And so, and it's very important that it appears that there is no, let's say, bias uh, when uh, or over politicization of these matters of rule of law. That does not mean that we should not address them politically. And by the way, at the end of the day, I think we have to address them politically because the reality is that Article 7 um, does not provide a solution for the issues we are now facing. Because, as you know, it requires unanimity of all the other countries when it is to suspend the rights of the country that is not complying with the principle of rule of law. So at the end of the day, it has to be political. Yes, but the cases that are launched should be following the highest standards of legal objectivity. Uh, and that was the case when the commission launched issues uh, launch infringement procedures in terms of independence of the media, independence of the data protection authorities, independence of the central bank, or the age of the judges. So look at going at it from a legal point of view to avoid precisely this bias that I think sometimes it can happen. So the second question about um, China, um, Taiwan, NATO, of course, I mean, <laughs> I, it's a very difficult issue, of course, I'm not going to... Uh, it's an, a scenario we don't want to contemplate. But uh, NATO, as I said before, the treaty obligations of, uh, of, of the uh, coming from NATO are the protection or defense of the North Atlantic area, European country, Europe and North America. They do not extend to Southeast Asia or to, or to Asia in general. Uh, having said that, NATO is now devising a strategy towards China for the reasons that were mentioned um, by um, Karl Gershman and Guillem of Meister. So today the consensus in NATO is that um, Russia and China represent a problem for overall security, including security of North Atlantic Alliance. So, but that does not mean that NATO has any kind of obligation to intervene uh, in a conflict that uh, intervene military. So uh, uh, act, uh, activating Article 5th in case of uh, um, uh, Taiwan or other issue in that, in that area. Um, I think this, the third question was about, I'm sorry, I don't, the third Rich. question was? Rich. This was whether Dominic Raab can be a mediator oh, between not, the transatlantic I mean, uh, not, uh, Islamic um, <laughs> fundamentalism. So that, that, that yeah. the question was quite complex. Yes, it is. Uh, I mean, once again, I came back to my point about rule of law. We have nothing against the different religions, including the, the right not to have religion. But of course, we have to be absolutely firm when there is any violation of the basic values that we have in Europe. And we are seeing that, namely what happened recently in, in, a, in, a, in France, the beheading of a, a, prof, a teacher at a high school by a a jihadist by an Islamist uh, militant is, of course, uh, a reminder of the, the real danger that that represents for European values and for our societies. So in that case, I think we have to react strongly. By the way, I think President Macron now is doing that. Um, and I hope he will succeed on that. Because if not, if there is not a perception in our societies that Europeans are able to defend their own values, then it will have, we'll see the rise of more populism, more nationalism, more xenophobic movements. So those of us that want a society that is free from these nationalist, nativist, xenophobic trends, we have to stand firm when there is a violation 
coming from whoever makes it, in this case, um, uh, Islamist movements. Now, about the United Kingdom or, or, or this, this minister, I don't know sufficiently the current foreign minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, uh, is in a very interesting position. You know, there was that famous sentence of Dean Acheson many years ago, a Secretary of State American, who said the United Kingdom has lost an empire and has not yet found a role. At that time, the United, um, the United States wanted the United Kingdom to be part of the European community. And in fact, the United Kingdom, after opposition from France, um, um, and after the veto of President de Gaulle, joined the European community. But now they left. Uh, so there is here, uh, uh, there is in the United Kingdom now a great discussion internally about what role uh, the United Kingdom can play uh, as a bridge precisely between the United States and, and Europe. It's certainly true that the United Kingdom has, it's a very important power um, and a very international power. Even, um, I have no doubts about this commitment to internationalism of the United Kingdom government and, and the system. Uh, and they will try, of course, to use their great influence to shape this, um, this um, role. Now, is it going to be a kind of a, a media, a kind of middle of the road? I think, frankly, from a European Union perspective, that should not be the case. I mean, I think we, the European Union, do not need any country for us to have a relationship, a good constraint with the United States. With all respect for the United Kingdom, its abilities, its competence, its, network, its networks. And by the way, the United States also do not need any kind of country, even a, a, such a close partner as the United Kingdom to be, let's say, the go-between. We don't need go-betweens. I, I think we should not need any go-between between the European Union and the United States. I think we should come to the principles of what I said earlier, complicity, democratic complicity, and transatlantic complicity, convergence between Europe and the United States. R Rita. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Dr. Gershman and Dr. Hofmeister would like to, to comment uh, on the questions. Uh, yes, of course. Um, the, uh, I mean, on the first question, I wanna, again, I, I mentioned uh, this uh, initiative taken by the European Union in July. And there was also now this audit that the European Union is undertaking. It was announced on uh, September the 30th um, under the leadership of uh, Vera Jarova, who is the EU's uh, chief of uh, rule of law, uh, to really uh, try to make judgments about uh, backsliding within the European Union. I know that Poland and Hungary were very disturbed by this. They're now negotiating it. And it will involve access to EU resources. I think this is a very important step, and uh, I commend uh, her, uh, Vera Jarova, and uh, the European uh, Commission for taking, uh, for taking this uh, step. Regarding uh, Taiwan, um, you know, I think, let me say two things. Um, first, the, uh, uh, I, I think we have to reconsider um, the issue of ambiguity, which is really part of U.S. policy, but also European policy and NATO policy regarding what China would do if, what the, uh, the, the West would do if China invaded Taiwan. It's becoming a very urgent problem. And I think we have to be much, much more explicit. You know, one of the reasons I think that uh, the Soviet Union decided to give the green light uh, for um, uh, Kim Il-sung's invasion uh, of South Korea in uh, 1950 was that uh, uh, Secretary Acheson had put the defense of South Korea outside of the uh, security perimeter uh, that the United States would defend. And I think that's very dangerous. I think we have to send a very, very clear signal. And I also think we have to show more solidarity with Taiwan. I was extremely impressed when the president of the Czech Senate went, led a delegation of 89 Czech political leaders, businessmen, and others to Taiwan just a couple of months ago. And he was the first head of uh, foreign parliament to speak to the uh, Taiwanese parliament. And in his speech, he echoed John F. Kennedy when he was in Berlin uh, and he gave his famous uh, Ich bin ein Berliner speech. He declared, I am, a Ty I am Taiwanese. Uh, I think it's that kind of solidarity that will send a signal to China that there will be a reaction in the West if they, um, if, 
if uh, they take this very, very dangerous and aggressive action, um, which they have been threatening. And finally, regarding uh, the question about um, the, uh, Islam and uh, you know radical Islam and so forth, I think there is nothing that the West can do that is more important than to really help Tunisia's democratic transition succeed. This is the first Arab uh, democracy, and it, it's essential that that uh, transition succeed. There also, it's also very important to stand with the, uh, you know, the reformist prime minister of Iraq today, Mustafa uh, Kadimi, uh, that people in Afghanistan are very, very worried. Uh, they're tr uh, an emerged civil society is trying to defend the rights of women in Afghanistan, all of these people, and of course in Turkey, they all need the uh, democratic support and solidarity of the West. We have to remember that the extremists represent they do not represent the Muslim countries and the Muslim people. There are people within countless uh, Arab and other Muslim countries that are trying to fight for democracy. There were recent polls done that the overwhelming majority of people in the Middle East want democracy, even though they have to be a little bit clearer on how they defend democracy. Uh, but still, the, the, the democracy has a very positive reputation uh, in, the, in the Muslim world, and people want it and uh, the people who want it deserve our support. Yeah, uh, the two Thank points, uh, very, very brief. First, I want to underline what Carl Gershman has said about Taiwan. I have been a uh, few times in Taiwan and I, my impression is that it is uh, probably the most advanced uh, democracy in Asia in terms of civil liberties and pluralism and, and many things. Really impressive and uh, to see people in Chinese language, uh, 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 people, authorities, uh, speaking uh, about uh, human rights, about democracy in the same uh, concept, with the same concept, we defend. This is very, really impressive and you will not find it so easily in Japan or Korea and, or, or other Asian countries. So I would very much like uh, the Europeans to be a little bit more clear regarding their position uh, towards uh, Taiwan. We actually discuss a lot about China uh, and we discuss how to learn uh, by one hand to cooperate with China, but also by the other hand uh, to defend our interests. And I think uh, Taiwan eventually uh, can become uh, 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 an important point uh, where we can prove uh, if we are really committed with our values or if we uh, simply follow some kind of double standards. The other point, uh, I also, I'm also convinced that democracy is um, the model for many people in the Arab or in the Islamic uh, countries. Um, however, uh, I think one problem of democracy we also have to mention, uh, and this is the delivery of democracy, because people want to have democracy because they want to have personal freedoms, but they also, of course, expect uh, improvement of their economies of their personal economy of the social uh, company we know that democracy is not an economic model it is a model about politics yeah, about freedom personal freedoms and so on but uh, unfortunately because of the weakness of some democracies also the economic output of m many democracies is very very weak and therefore there's a lot of dissatisfaction and this gives room to the populists and some other forces who, of course, uh, are uh, imaging uh, democracy. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for more questions. Uh, it's now up to me to close uh, the session, thanking once again our guest speakers for the exceptional contribution. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to thank also uh, the session attendees and the questions and, and comments sent to us. We will now have a short break uh, and the program restarts at 5 p.m. Uh, Portugal time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.